and welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of Paul Borough Council and GM. The citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 25. Now this week we will be looking at the public aspect of family law and have the chance to think about how far the duty of local councils extends with respect to vulnerable children in their area. The children in question are now adults, but back in 2006, they were placed, alongside their mother, in a council house next to a rather awful family who were known to engage in antisocial behaviour. Throughout their time at this council house, both the children and the mother became the targets of abuse and harassment from this family that included vandalism, attacks on the property, threats of violence, as well as verbal and physical abuse. Despite all this, Paul Borough Council, who are the other party to this case, only managed to rehouse GN more than five years later at the end of 2011. During this time, the children were recognised by the council as being children in need, which is a legal status within the Children Act 1989, and they had social workers allocated to them, so they were certainly on the council's radar. Thinking about this sequence of events as well as the physical and psychological harm that had been suffered, you might think that the nature of the legal action being taken would be pretty straightforward, but surprisingly that turned out not to be the case. Now obviously GN was seeking damages for the harm suffered, but originally the claim was brought in relation to both the housing duties of the local council, as well as the duties associated with the protection of children. This was struck out because, according to the judge, the legislation does not give rise to a duty of care in these circumstances. The claimants accepted this decision in relation to the housing duties, but not in relation to the Children Act, and so that became the subject of an appeal. While the High Court found in favour of GN, this was reversed by the Court of Appeal, who took the side of the council in holding that there was no such duty. Being such an important case, The proceedings went up to the Supreme Court, which is where we pick it up. So to get into the specifics, the claimants are relying on two distinct sections of the Children Act 1989, Section 17 and Section 47. Section 17 establishes a general duty for local authorities to promote and safeguard the welfare of children in their local area by providing a range of appropriate services. Meanwhile, Section 47 states that where a child is likely to suffer significant harm, then the local authority has a duty to investigate. That seems fairly open and shut in terms of the proceedings brought by GN, but while it was accepted that there was indeed a duty in a very general sense of the word, that does not necessarily mean that this corresponds to an actual cause of action under the statute. Instead, the question is whether there is liability for a breach of a common law duty of care resulting from the performance of these duties under the Act. That might look like a small difference, but it is important because a duty of care does not automatically exist at common law simply because a public body has a statutory power or duty. This remains true even when the exercise of that function might operate to prevent harm. If that seems especially harsh, then I think it is worth us taking a minute to at least try and give an explanation. Past cases such as X Miners and Bedfordshire County Council from 1995 justified this position purely on public policy grounds, which is a little vague but essentially covers their actions on the basis that liability might encourage defensive practices and that there also has to be consideration that public bodies are subject to limited resources despite this broad responsibility so it has to be accepted that any system will not be perfect. For those of you who have studied tort law, this is not dissimilar to the discussions around police liability, which also tend to crop up in this area. However, in the same way that Lord Reed led something of a charge against the broad exemption from police liability in last year's case of Robinson and Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, he has, interestingly enough, done something similar again in this case albeit in a different context. Lord Reed held that X was no longer good law, and that it is certainly possible that a common law duty might arise. In particular, if a situation occurs in which a private individual would owe a duty of care, then the same may be said of a public authority. 
Taking into account this distinction, we can now come back to our question as to whether Poole Borough Council has liability for breaching a common law duty of care. To arrive at an answer for this, we need to once again think about an aspect of tort law, this time liability for an omission. Generally speaking, a tort will arise where a person or body performs some function, but does so negligently. On the other hand, there is almost always no liability for an omission. The classic case from the classroom is that even if a person chose not to save a drowning toddler from a shallow pool, then they would not be liable under tort law because they had not undertaken such a responsibility. Applying that to GN, and we can see that his situation is much closer to an omission. What I mean by this is that it is more accurate to describe what happened as the council failing to step in and protect GN and his brother, rather than the council actually harming the claimants through their negligence. How, though, does this square with the fact that the council do appear to have assumed a responsibility to investigate and monitor the children in line with the Children Act? The problem is that this investigation and monitoring is not some sort of service provided to the family, and furthermore, it is not as if the council ever actively assumed responsibility for the physical and mental safety of the claimants. If, for example, Paul Borough Council had taken the children into care at some point, then the situation would be different because that is much clearer assumption of responsibility for the welfare of those minors. In the end, the Supreme Court decided that there was no direct liability in tort. But before we can begin to wrap up this episode, we also need to consider the alternative claim that was made by GN in relation to the vicarious liability of the council. Again, it's worth briefly explaining what vicarious liability is for those listeners who are less familiar with this area. Basically, this is where an employer is liable for the actions of their employees performed in the course of employment. In this claim, the idea is that the council should be liable for the negligence of its social workers. The issue is that this is not really dissimilar to the legal principles that we have already discussed above. Any social worker in question will certainly be employed by the council and will have had a more direct relationship with the children at the heart of this case, but that does not necessarily imply that they assumed responsibility towards them. It is true that such a responsibility does not have to be expressly undertaken and often will need to be implied by the surrounding context, but it does still have to be proven to exist, and that just doesn't appear to be the case here, as the justices held that there was no assumption of responsibility in the first place. The final throw of the dice for the claimants comes in the argument that they should have been moved from their difficult living situation to some other alternative, even if that was into temporary care. On the surface, that seems like a completely reasonable request, but moving children like this is understandably not that straightforward. For the council to be able to step in and issue a care order, then it would have to be shown that the claimants were suffering due to a lack of reasonable parental care, but that clearly wasn't the case here. Instead, the harm derived from a third party, and so the hands of the council were pretty much tied in this regard. As we come to try and analyse this case ourselves, it does certainly seem like this is a disappointing loss for the claimants. They suffered for far longer than they should have at the hands of the neighbours from hell who, to be frank, just sound awful. Few would disagree that they should be entitled to some sort of justice, but as legal analysts it is our job to ask whether it should have been pulled by a council to pay the price, and if so, what are the consequences that flow from this liability? It is certainly not difficult to see why the proceedings were brought against the council, as they do have statutory responsibilities that relate to housing and child welfare, but why has this proven so hard to translate into actionable claims in court? The answer, unsurprisingly, relates to politics and the way that local government is funded. There are various generic duties that a local authority might have, such as prioritising the welfare of children and providing adequate housing to those in need. But that only raises further questions about what exactly that means. A child's welfare is somewhere on a spectrum between, on the one hand, them going hungry and, on the other hand, being given a Nintendo Switch and whatever they desire. But where to draw the line is dependent on your point of view. 
In this case, the basic housing requirements of Gn are met because he is not destitute, but as we have seen, his circumstances were far from ideal based on the abuse that he has suffered. Whether the council has met its duty in this situation is therefore an open question, and while there are many who would say that it has certainly not, we can at least begin to see why the courts are reluctant to step in on questions of policy. Where funding and resources are limited, a finding of a breach here might solve this problem going forward, but also has the potential to open up other serious problems as well. Taking all of this into account, this sounds like a disappointing result, but in the wider legal context, this is actually a big win for potential future claimants. The reason for this is that, as we discussed, this case led to the overturning of X and Bedfordshire, a case that previously established an almost blanket ban on the liability of local councils. With that out of the way, the door is open for future claims in situations where a private individual would be liable. That may not cover this particular case, but it will others, and so this should be welcomed as a significant development. It also fits with what we have already talked about, because it does not create a cause of action for some of the more generic duties, but only where the council has assumed some specific responsibility that can easily be evaluated by a judge. Of course, none of this helps GN, but I do think this case raises some important questions about what has happened here even if the council is able to avoid liability. For a start, where were the police in all this? We don't know all of the precise details about what happened during the relevant time frame, but even the basic facts tell us that this abuse was allowed to continue for an extended period without any resolution, and this on its own is a severe indictment of Dorset police. The council too could and should have done more, it is after all possible to evict tenants who engage in antisocial behaviour. Furthermore, it just seems unlikely that the council could not do any more to support GN at this time, even if they were unable to move him to safer accommodation or take him into care. In the end, the lack of any legal recourse was only the tip of the iceberg for GN, who was really failed by the system as a whole, a system that was supposed to protect the most vulnerable. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the UK Law Weekly Podcast, and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. Remember, you can find me online. The website is uklawweekly.com. I am at Marcus Cleaver on Twitter, and the UK Law Weekly Podcast has its own Twitter account at at UK Law Weekly. And UK Law Weekly also has a Facebook group as well, so make sure to join us on there and join in the discussion. I'll be back with another episode next week, but for now, bye!